Well, so why don't we start with like a few definitions and then we can talk about, I think a good way to like tackle these types of topics at like, I don't know, 40,000 foot levels is to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the applications of VR, like where it could go. Because right now it's it's usually all about like gaming and entertainment. But what I'm really right. excited about is where it could go for more kind of practical use cases like education or enterprise or like manufacturing is another one or like healthcare even like doctors healthcare. getting kind of like training yeah. through a virtual environment um and 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 like you know stuff like that so anyway we, we can get into all of that but i would say right. that you know first with definitions everyone's excited about uh both vr and ar so let's first divide those two things and, and you're familiar with the term ar if not i can go through that i am yeah yeah, yeah, yeah so you I know am. so um and, and the difference of course is vr is a fully immersive experience so you put on the goggles, and we can go into the different tiers of like goggles and products in a minute, but you put on the goggles um, or headset, they're called head-mounted displays is the official term, but you put on a headset, and then you're fully immersed in, in a certain right. kind of you know graphical or virtual world. Whereas augmented reality, which is is the longer term opportunity, I think you know it, it'll it'll come late, but it'll be bigger. Um, augmented reality is is essentially what you probably know as is as Google Glass. Like you're probably familiar with Google right. Glass, right? Now Google Glass was before its time, so I think that you know Google Glass has done kind of bad PR in some ways for the world of augmented reality because it's kind of been laughed off the stage, so to speak. Um, um, Google yeah. Glass was was more in the uh, just to level set. We're on the AR side of the discussion at this point, augmented reality, okay. where it's like instead of the where you've got the goggles and you're fully immersed in something, you're actually just wearing a set of glasses. You can actually see the world around you. You can walk around on the street. You can see everything without like bumping into walls. And the difference is that there is like an overlay on your field of vision. Which, you know, informs right. you about your surroundings. Like it'll say, take a left here if it's a navigation app. Or it'll say, you know, um, the, the, the gastro pub that you like um, or you've indicated things you like is, is right there on your right. Like it's just kind of directional type of stuff. And I think that eventually that augmented reality overlay situation is going to be a lot right. more practical than VR. And the reason why is because with VR, it's only practical that you use it like – you know, maybe a few hours a day, like in media terms. It's like, you know, how often do you watch TV or view things on your iPhone or like tablets? In in that measurement, there's only like a few hours or minutes per day that it's possible to be in VR, whereas AR, augmented reality, you could theoretically wear it all day long because you can just kind of, it's just an overlay on your field of vision. So Google Glass was like the first iteration of that where it just was before its time. But we're starting to see some other kind of glasses. And that's, again, further off. So I'll, I'll put that aside, the AR thing, and come back to VR. I just wanted to make that delineation first. Okay. Um, so with VR, you mentioned cardboard. And cardboard is like the yeah. kind of – it's like the gateway drug for, for VR. <laughs> um, because the, the challenge with VR is – that though it's like so amazing and everyone that tries it on for the first time, and I'm talking about the more advanced forms of it, like Oculus Rift and HTC Vive, you know, those right. forms of VR, once someone straps it on and uses it, they're blown away. They love it. Everyone is just like, that's amazing. That's, that's the way media is going. In 10 years, we're all going to be doing this and watching movies like this. But the challenge is that um, there is really a barrier to adoption in one, the price, and two, the accessibility so not everyone, you know, has that chance to get that first, like, wow moment. Um, so two things are starting to alleviate that. One is the lower end experiences like, like cardboard. Um, and I think the New York right. Times has done a great job in really seeding that by, yes, like actually distributing the hardware itself, like along with the Sunday right. paper. They had that campaign where they were sending it out. And then also bankrolling some of the actual production of the 360 video that can be viewed on cardboard. So that was some of the kind of embedded journalism they did um, where it was lots of just different kind of pieces that were filmed with 360. So, so the ecosystem requires, one, the hardware, so like someone having the device, but also a good amount of content out there that can be viewed on the device. And, and here's another interesting concept that I've been dwelling on, which is the classic chicken and egg dilemma. Um, and and right. it's, it's something that happens in, in a lot of emerging areas. But the way it plays out in VR is that, you know, without a lot of content out there, people aren't really incentivized to go out and like spend like, you know, a thousand dollars on a you know, new VR headset. And, you know, when there's only just a certain amount of stuff out there and conversely, right. conversely, like the content creators 
without having that installed base of like, you know, all these people that have the devices, they are they find it hard to justify the business case to to make the content because it's expensive to, to film the 360 content. So it's like that chicken and egg challenge and it's slowly being right. chipped away by just people kind of creating cool stuff. Um, but sorry, that goes off track just a little bit. Let's get back to... Well, I'm going to go off track with you for a second. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, see, I keep saying, I, keep, I see these tremendous figures, $20 billion by 2020 is what the conference I went to. And I, my eyes just kind of widened huh. and I thought, wow, that's a tremendous amount of of money that's going into this, and it's all in development stage. And you know, as you, as we know, there are a lot of things that a lot of these companies are, have not even. I think I think um, what was it? Um, Google just started just brought out with the day. Um, oh God, I can't, I can't believe I can't, I can't remember it. But they just brought out the product. But there are all these different things that everyone's in. But like, but here, I think it came out seventy nine dollars. The the, the, yeah, daydream the daydream one. Yeah. yeah. 70, uh. Yeah, that's going to be another. That's like the next gateway drug. It's like stepping one level up the ladder from yeah. from cardboard. Yeah, yeah. Is that but that's part? Is that considered to be part of the twenty billion dollar industry? Or are we looking at different? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Companies? There are a lot of measurements out there. I'm not sure exactly of the one you're talking about, but some of the ones that I've seen. Uh, it's a company yeah. called DigiCapital. I'll send you the data that they've put out. I think they said thirty billion by two thousand twenty, and their measurement, which might be different than the one that you're looking at in terms of what it includes, includes everything. So it's it's hardware sales, so it's the sales of yeah. the actual devices, but also there are a lot of other pieces to that puzzle where there's going to be revenue in VR. So the content sales. So it's picture it analogous to like. If like video games, like you buy a video game console and then you got to buy the games, or you buy a right. DVD player and then you got to buy the actual DVDs. It's going to be like that. So you get, the hardware is one part of it, the actual sales of the content, whether it be movies, games, other things, and then also another piece of that kind of puzzle is is advertising. Like there'll be a media and advertising component where all of the same ways that media makes money today, whether it be ad supported or whether it be subscription. Um, you know that that model will translate over to VR. So there's a little bit of that. There's probably also, um, you know, how else would there be revenue? Um, let me think. So it's hardware, it's content, it's software. It's like the developer ecosystem, like you know what people are charging to kind of build the stuff and build the content. It's just going to be a whole value chain that revolves around it. Um, you know, analogous to like if you look at the mobile device, like how how. How, how do we measure the size of the mobile market? It's, it's all of those things. It's like the sales of iPhones. It's the sales of the apps. It's the people right. that make money developing apps. It's, it's, it's what we call an ecosystem. So I think that when you, you know, to answer your question about like the, the 20, 20 billion by however, what, whatever the year was, it, it's like all that stuff. Yeah. I know. And again, it's, it's for all these different things that you're discussing. It's not one solitary thing, and there's so many different incubators and so many different yeah. companies that are diving into this because everyone, obviously, and it's a smart move to be one of the first are the ones who are going to have the biggest share of this. Yes. But it's going to be a. I don't. I mean, I mean, I think what you're saying too is that you know, chicken and the egg too. It's just like what is going to drive what? Yeah. Where is this revenue going to materialize? Because at the bottom, at the end of the day, there's a lot of money that's being invested in it. For some of these things you're talking about, entertainment, yeah. healthcare, everybody, and it's so yeah. smart. And well, I, I look at it in a historical perspective too, where like we're all seeing. You're right. Like we're all seeing this massive opportunity. We all believe it's kind of all on faith, but we believe this will be the next major technological transformation or shift. And when I say shift, what I mean is like if you look at the major shifts over the last kind of like 30 years, there was the PC, um, and then there was the commercial internet. And then there was the smartphone. And we believe that the right. VR and AR will be on the level of magnitude of transformation that those technological revolutions had because it will change the way that we consume things. Like, and, and these right. revolutions usually start with the hardware, like a new piece of hardware, a form factor. And then what builds around that is kind of different forms of content and different creativity. And here's the other cool part. The, the things we haven't even imagined yet, right? So it's like the, the, the foundation, the building blocks are there, but there's going to be all kinds of different cool applications and creativity that builds on it. So if you think about the iPhone as an example of that principle, uh, when the iPhone first came out, um, few people often remember this, but the first year of the iPhone um, – you know, there were only like 16 apps, which are the ones that shipped with the device that were like Apple apps. The app store right. didn't didn't come out until one year later. 
Um, and at that point, all of a sudden, there was this like flowering of innovation and creativity. And, you know, maybe 90% of it was just stupid things like games and crossword puzzles and things that just weren't necessarily new. But there were also a lot of new kind of innovation of ways to use the phone, such as like as a payment device or, you know, the fact that I have my phone on me now, it means I can call an Uber wherever I am and, you know, stuff like that. I think it just stuff that wasn't really imagined at the onset, but the kind of third party development ecosystem really starts to kind of be inspired and create things on top of it. And I think that's what we're going to see with with VR. But what I'll do is um, I'm going to I'll send you a I get I give a few presentations. You may have already seen them because you mentioned that you saw something. But um, there, there are two presentations I give each of which one of them talks about some of the the current kind of where we are now. But the other one goes into some of those like historical parallels. So I'll send you those videos. Okay. They're like 10 minutes each, you know, if, if you want to watch them. I was, you know, there was one thing that really struck me, and I think it was it was the chart that you had, which was the near term, short term, and long term projection. Oh yeah, no, I, I thought remember. that was I, I, I thought that was brilliant. It really yeah. did because it kind of puts in perspective too. You're talking about mobile VR, which makes sense. Everyone yeah. who doesn't have a phone that was that was not the case beforehand, but. If you don't have a phone, you have a little flip phone. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work out anymore. Yeah. You know, and I love you talked about, and you just mentioned this just now, you know, the PC, which is amazing. That was a new development back then. And that was kind of, and it still is. I mean, when I'm looking at anything, I go on, you know, I go to YouTube to look at some of the um, the different um, VR and AR that I can consume, you know, from my, from my, from my desktop using my phone, and it's just really amazing. And then you talk, you know, and it goes, and I think you said something in your presentation, but it goes back to mobile VR. Yeah, it'll again. eventually end up back at mobile, yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, there's so much, there is so much money, and I guess that's why, you know, the Googles of the world and, you know, and Microsoft, I mean, they're really, I mean, the money that they're putting in, yeah. we, I mean, it's, it's, it's infinite at this point. There's so many different opportunities. Well, you bring up a good point, too, in that, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we're all kind of taking this on faith in terms of, like, an, yeah. analysts like me that say, like, yeah, this is going to be huge, blah, blah, blah. But I really believe it. But one other just supporting point is if you look at the the amount of money, to your point, the amount of money that, like, the tech giants are putting into this. And those are smart people, <laughs> I, I believe. So I think that's another just kind of, like, I don't know, a, uh, a leading indicator of of like that we're going we're talking about a major topic here is what just the amount of money that they're putting in and also I think interestingly we were talking earlier about the chicken and egg thing I think what's going yeah. to like push the chicken and egg situation like over the hump is going to be um deep pocketed companies like Google that treat this as yeah. kind of a loss leader so it's an investment that they're just pouring a lot of money into and getting hardware out there and getting software out there and and losing money on it like in the short term in order to yeah. seed that marketplace that they know they want to own. Right. Oh, gosh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, yeah, and it's, Google is a very, it's just, I'm just so fascinated by Google. I mean, the fact that they're behind this new, um, gosh, this new film that, um, that uses Google Earth as its foundation this kid oh, yeah. in India. I'm just, yeah, what is it called? Is, is, it lo- is it loan? No, what is it called? I forget the name of it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. But they're using that, and I'm sure that you know. I haven't looked at because this is, I would love to do an entertainment. And my background is really in entertainment news. Mm-hmm. But I'd love to go back and look at the story about that because I think entertainment really fuels so many different things. And certainly, this is a part of it. This is going to fuel entertainment and how entertainment is seen. I mean, I think there's yeah. a movie too with with Michael Fassbender. Yep. Alien Convent. And that's going to be released in VR yeah. <laughs> at movie theaters. And that's, I mean, that's, that's also a fascinating kind of – there's so many subtopics of this overall kind of VR topic. Yeah, but one of the fascinating the ones is that, you know, as you mentioned, it's going to be yeah. such a large kind of inflection point in entertainment and movies. But what that, what that entails is an interesting debate that's happening in Hollywood, which kind of directors – some sure. directors are excited about it and some are actually fearful of it because yeah. – and they're, they're not admitting they're fearful, but they're just kind of kind of – downplaying it and but whatever yeah. but but the point is that it's going to revolutionize the way that stories are told so the tactics the directorial tactics the blocking shots the sound all of that and the way that a story is told like a, a funny example that i always think of and i, I someone told me about this re- recently and i thought yeah you're right like that's that's gonna have to someone's gonna have to figure out a solution which is you know wh- whenever there's anything being filmed you know, in the background or behind the camera, there's all kinds of crew and there's like grips and there's big ladders being moved around and everything. 
in VR or, or in 360 video, you know, you have to have the crew, like, you know, hide behind trees and things because it's the, you know, yeah. it's the whole 360 plane that's being uh, visible. There's going to, you know, and this lends itself too because I don't think, one of the only reasons why I love getting DVDs and not seeing things in movie theaters, I love getting DVDs after the movie's out just because I get to see what, how the movie was created, the interviews, oh, the yeah. technological things. Extras. I mean, I, oh my gosh, it just, it's just really incredible. That is, and that's a different source of revenue also for, for theaters, for, um, for movie companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, it, it really does, like you said, it just kind of mounts, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another. There's so many different ways of make of revenue these days. Yeah. Well, here's what, what um, kind of movie theaters and film production companies are doing now. Um, they are kind of m making add-ons to, like, say after you, you're finished watching, like, the new Star Wars. Uh, they haven't announced this, but this is a hypothetical example. You know, after the um, uh, Rogue One, the, the new Star Wars is coming out, say that there was, right. like, a five-minute VR experience, and they passed out headsets to everyone in the theater, where, like, after you've seen the movie, you're all excited about it. It's kind of a first-hand perspective 360 video with a headset of like you know flying around in an X-wing fighter or or something along those lines, um, so a lot of them are doing it in that way where it's kind of these companion pieces to to the yeah. actual work, and I think that's how it'll start. And, and eventually, like you said, with the Fastbender movie, there'll be you know standalone works that will be completely in 360, and it'll be a slow um, kind of progression towards that end. But um, but I, I think it'll be um, it'll be interesting. The other the other benefit that that VR brings to film is that it it compels repeat viewing. Um, you know, so yeah. it's not just watching a movie once, but then you're going to want to watch it again because you want to see, like, see it from different angles. Like, oh, that whole movie, I was looking in this direction. Now for this scene, I want to look over there. And that compels, right. you know, people paying more and more and more to see it five times, right? No, that's, no you're absolutely right. And, you know, so before, the, before you know, a decade or so ago, you would, you know, everybody would see Titanic. Ten times, it was a different kind of of audience. Obviously, the young women, young girls who fell in love with Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. But now they do it because they want. They can do it, and they can do it from their. They can they can actually do it do it from the television set if they have a TV. No, they don't want to have a television. They can do it from their phone. Yeah. Repeat viewing is huge, and I just think you're right about that. I think it's basically it's going to create a different way of introducing film work. It's yeah. just not about the films anymore. It's about all these other creations. Yep. And that's really fascinating. And I think that's, I think you're right about, you know, VR, AR, there's going to be so much. But, it's, but I'm curious to know how, and I think you talked about this a little bit in some of the videos that I watched, how, you know, the adoption rate of basically consuming some of this, of basically making this purchase. What, is it, what do you think it's going to be that's going to compel people to really dive in? I think it's going to be the content. It goes back to the chicken and egg situation. So I think that for um, people to justify the purchase of high-end VR, I mean, so w with things like the, the gateway drugs, like like cardboard, and then and then even yeah. Daydream and, and Gear VR, which are you know sub one hundred dollar purchases, um, and and you have yeah. to have the compatible phone too, but the, just the headset is under a hundred dollars. Um, I think that the availability of content will drive this. And you know, we we hear the the cliche, it shouldn't I could shouldn't say cliche cuz I I like I'm very content heavy content appreciative, but but content is king, right? The the the, the right. axiom that content is king. Um and that's proved over so many different media delivery formats over history. I think is absolutely going to prove out and sustain in VR. So I think it's it's going to answer your question, it's going to be the the availability of good content and the anticipation to see that next movie or that next kind of thing that everyone's talking about will drive people to actually purchase the hardware to be able to see it. Right, right, right. And so if, if, if I ask you then, your projections, because I know I can go back and I can see all the different things that are up, that have been released, that, have been, that are in development in 2016, mm -hmm. but come this new year, are you, are you still staying to the idea that it's really about content creation is going to drive this market? Well, yeah, next year, well, two things. Yep, two things. In 2017, it will be the availability of content. It's got to hit a critical mass before there is like mass adoption of, of headset purchases. There's that. Yeah. Number two, um, it, I, I, I go back to the analogy of arcades, video arcades, 
in the uh-huh. late 70s, early 80s, and all the way up until the 90s, before console gaming, video games, before console gaming became tenable and affordable at a mass scale, people would go outside of their house and go to arcades to play. So that's a massive opportunity yeah. we're seeing being fulfilled now with what is called location-based VR or VRcades, VR arcades. Um, so that's going to be something that gets people into VR simply by not having to own the equipment, but going to one of these locations and being able to pay by the hour or by the game, just like an arcade, and strap on the headset right. and experience it in that more kind of lower friction. So instead of buying, it's almost like they're renting, right, of the, by, by, by the time. So that um, so, so the content to, to fuel the purchases, the VR arcades is the second thing. Um, and the third thing that will drive all this is I think that, you know, now that we have all three major kind of head-mounted displays, headsets on the market now, which is the PlayStation VR, the um, Mm -hmm. Oculus Rift, um, and the HTC Vive. Those are what we call the big three. With all the three of those now on the market, uh, the PlayStation VR just came out. um, So now all three of those on the market. Going into 2017, I believe there's going to be a lot of price competition um, that will start to drive that price down and make it more tenable for mainstream audiences. And in addition to price competition, you have the natural march of Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's Law is the technological law that drives basically all technology. It's the reason why, you know, when you see a brand new flat screen TV and it's $3,000 and you don't want to pay that much, and then the next year it's half that. Um, Right. It essentially means it's a, it's a law that drives chipsets in technology, which is the one of the building blocks at the foundation of technology and, and the hardware. Um, they, they basically, you can fit twice as many chips on a semiconductor um, every 18 months. That, that amount doubles and the price gets cut in half. So that essentially drives technology forward. The price comes down. And that's just like the case with all technology. So that natural kind of tendency of Moore's Law will uh, drive the price down. Plus, there'll be price competition. So that's the third thing, price coming down. The second thing was the VR arcades, and the first thing was the content. And, you know, and I, I love looking at demographics, too, and seeing, is anyone tracking this? Is it a Nielsen, is Nielsen perchance, tracking some of these? Because everybody wants to know, who is it that you should market to? I mean, obviously, young people are the first drivers yeah. for anything that's technological. I mean, certainly they're no longer watching television. Yep, the, the Nielsen's <laughs> yeah. and the comm scores of the world, I think, will come around to this, and I think they'll be a little bit late. Nielsen, I, I feel like, personally, was a little bit slow to some of the usage patterns of things like mobile. Um, and they eventually got there. But, I mean, up until recently, they were still measuring you know, home-based entertainment watching in a survey-based methodology, which has always been their methodology, even though a great right. deal of content is delivered digitally now and can actually be tracked, where the over-the-air right. signals previously weren't tracked, which is why that compelled a survey-based methodology. You know, what did you watch last night? And that's how the... Or, or, or they had a meter. They also had... Actually, I'm sorry. I misspoke. They went past the survey methodology a while ago, and they went with, like, metered boxes that they would distribute throughout homes in America. Um, that would just kind of measure the cable signal or the broadcast signal. Um, so I think, you know, it took them a while to just kind of like come around to the current technology. So I think extrapolating from that, I think it'll be a while before they actually start to measure this in the true kind of native sense that it should be measured. In the meantime, you know, that's you bring up a good question because that I think there's a big opportunity there to be kind of some of the measurement and analytics firms um, that track all this. I, I and it's interesting because I one of my previous incarnations I actually worked for Adweek magazine. Mm-hmm. And nice. so whenever I talked to anyone in, you know, different media companies, everybody always had this big complaint about how they track yep. measurements, yeah. audiences and eyeballs and all that thing. Because that that's a fundamental part of how they make money, clearly. Yeah. And it's like I, I am not I could be a spokesperson for it, but it's a very difficult area and I can only imagine the thorny part about basically measuring it. With with mobile devices and everybody, you know, and and anything they have, you know, that they can take with them, they can they can walk around with them, go to a cafe. How do you begin to track that? It's a very yeah, it's such it's, an interesting area it's to explore. Tough. Whenever the there's guy. any whenever there's any new medium, there's a tendency to kind of overlay or force upon that medium the kind of measurement tools. Of the previous medium. So that happened in mobile where, you know, in mobile advertising, which is an area I've looked at a lot over the last 10 years, the the actual kind of 
metrics were always like clicks and impressions because that's the way right. ad media was measured on the desktop. But clicks and yep. impressions is actually just such a bad tool. I think it actually does a disservice because it's a misleading tool when measuring yeah. mobile engagement. So we'll run into those same challenges with, with VR. And, and it's a learning curve, and it'll kind of evolve over time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is, and this, and this is, what, and this is what makes it excite, exciting. You want to delve into it. But you just, in, in the end, big media companies want to have like that bottom line. They want to have measurements. They want someone to measure it and say, this is a, this is a good thing to delve into. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting area to get into. Um, gosh. Am I missing anything? I, this is just wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. You put it in such a clear way for me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Basically, understand where this market's going. Well, one other thing I'll say. Um, and, and this this kind of just circles back to the beginning of our discussion of kind of the definitions. There are a few different tiers that it's important to know about, and this may or may not relate to what you're writing about, but I think it's just good background to wrap your head around because we started talking about cardboard. That's the gateway drug. One tier up from that is um, the Google Daydream and the uh, Samsung Gear VR. That's kind of tier two. Uh -huh. And then the top tier are the three, the big three that I mentioned earlier, Samsung um, or I'm sorry, Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and PlayStation VR. So those are the big three tiers. And and when you graduate up those tiers, there are feature sets that um, that grow with it. Like for example, a big kind of, I don't know, um, a, a point of technology that is used to often kind of differentiate these types of VR experiences is one called positional tracking. So for example, most VR has head tracking, where like if you put on the Google Google Cardboard. You can move it around, and that's head tracking. Like it, it, it knows where you're looking, and you know can you can see, you can move around in 360. That's head tracking. Positional tracking is kind of the holy grail, and that's resident in some of those higher tier ones, where not only are you just uh -huh. looking around, but you can actually walk around a space. Um, so for example, like if you put on a, a Google Cardboard and you look at one of those New York Times, um, uh, kind of productions they've made. The, the production right. itself, they say it's on rails. So even though it's immersive and you can look around, you can't control, like you can't walk around the scene. It, the, <laughs> the camera goes where it goes. And then you can head track or mo look around within that kind of general kind of area the camera's going. Now, the positional tracking is one level further where you can look around, you can move your head around at 360 degrees, and you can also walk around the scene. Um, and that's when we get into like the really kind of cool, crazy VR stuff. And and right now that positional tracking is only in games or graphical kind of types of things where you can kind of walk around and, you know. Um, so that's kind of like the next step. And I mentioned that just to kind of like delineate some of the flavors of VR because we've we spent most of the time talking about like the, the 360 video. And a lot of like VR purists will actually like get mad and start debating that 360 video is not true VR. It's really just 360 video. It's the able to walk around. And, and they're, they're looking forward to the day when you're not only looking around, but you're actually walking around the space. Um, so anyway, that's oh, that's yeah. one other kind of delineation that I would draw just for your own background on like the different tiers of what we're talking about here. Great. Thank okay. you so very much. I so appreciate this call again, Mike. I know it was last minute, but I was like, you know what? I'm working. Hopefully you'll be available. So thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, cool. great. Thank you so much, Mike. Okay, bye.